This is the Awful Announcing Podcast. Here's your host, Brandon Contes. All righty, welcome to episode 31 of the Awful Announcing Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Contes, and this week we have uh, sort of a special end of year episode. Um, it'll be chock full of best of clips and highlights from some of the interviews that we've done since relaunching the podcast back in April. But before we get to those, we also released Awful Announcing's annual Awfully Awards this week. So to chat about that and break a few of those categories down, we're, we're joined by Awful Announcing's Ben Koo, Andrew Buckholtz, and Sean Keeley. Thanks for joining, guys. And I, I, I want to start with the big one, Sports Media Person of the Year, our version of Time Person of the Year. So this is our Taylor Swift and... Congratulations to Pat McAfee on that, which is kind of funny because I, I I don't I don't think that Pat or the Pat McAfee show, for that matter, would say they enjoy all of the coverage that we give them. But like him, love him, hate him, I think we all have to at least admit that um, he is he's a major player in the sports media world, and he had a, a massive year by taking his show over to ESPN. So Ben. Let's start with you. Your thoughts on Pat McAfee as awful announcing sports media person of the year. Yeah, he got my vote. And in my write up, which I think it's publishing tomorrow, um, you know, I'm not a huge fan of Pat McAfee, um, but he was given two hours each weekday on ESPN. <clears throat> if you look at ESPN's roster of talent and who gets their own show for two hours a day, it's really like Stephen A. Smith, and that's it. You know, Mike Greenberg gets, I think, an hour with Get Up. Um, you know, you have Scott Van Pelt with an hour. Um, and not only does he have two hours a day, uh, he self-produces it. And they kind of do whatever they want without ESPN influence. Um, he's, you know, he signed his five-year, $85 million deal. Um and I think generally he's rubbed some people the wrong way, but um, he is a core part of ESPN strategy. There's been tons of controversy and people who have taken issue with paid interviews, some of the discourse on the show, um, just how it kind of sticks out on ESPN. But ESPN's really stood by them. And I, I think the thing that kind of won me over in terms of um, – you know, getting my vote in this. It's just, um, he seems like a core part of their, their strategy for younger viewers. Um, his Friday shows that he did on campuses were attended almost as well as game day on, on a lot of um, Fridays. And you can really tell that they're trying to um, address an audience that, you know, ESPN has failed to address. They tried barstool van talk. They do a lot of things on social media but this is their big kind of like trump card for um, trying to get more people watching ESPN, subscribing to cable, subscribing to a premium service uh, over the top or ESPN bet. And I think, you know, I think he's been popular with the right demographics and he has a lot of internal support. And even beyond his own two hour show, you find him on tons of other platforms. So. I think he's had a great year and it's hard not to say even, you know, despite my personal thoughts uh, that he isn't the, the person deserving of this award. Yeah. And, and just to be clear, I, I do think that this will have already published by the time that this, this podcast is already out. So like anyone listening can go to the website and, and read these awards now at this point. Um, Sean, your thoughts on, on McAfee. Yeah. I, I think first of all, I, I would say, I think, our coverage is a bit more even handed than perhaps maybe Pat and his um, team might notice. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, uh, but I also understand why they, they might gravitate towards, towards some of the uh, more critical coverage. But to me, it was never a question uh, whether or not Pat McAfee was the sports media person of the year. Like Ben was saying, whether you love him or hate him um, it was, it's been a meteoric rise. Uh, for him and to basically arguably become the face of ESPN, you know, maybe alongside Stephen A. Smith, 
um, so soon after establishing himself uh, is is wildly impressive. And, um, you know, when you look at how they've incorporated him into so many things, into college game day, into the alternate uh, broadcasts for the college football games, um, so many different ways. And, and, you know, I would I had the chance to attend college game day when they were at the University of Washington this year and just watching McAfee kind of play with the crowd during commercial breaks and uh, go over and shake everybody's hand behind the scenes. And uh, he, he's just a, a force of nature. And, and even if you don't like his thing, I think you can appreciate why he is so um, beloved by his audience. And, um, you know, I, I think it's been fascinating to watch him kind of grow into this role where I think some of the, the critical coverage may come in is that he is kind of in this in this in between place where he part of his whole thing is that he is, um, you know, he's just a, a good old boy. And he's just like he's just these guys who are, you know, it's crazy. Look at us where we are. Like we're a bunch of idiots, like they like to say. Um, but they also wield a lot of power and they wield a lot of, um, you know, narrative control in the sports media world. They get A-list guests all the time. They um, the Aaron Rodgers interviews uh, make can make a news cycle. Um, and so there's a lot of power there. And I think it's important, um, you know, whether they want and his team would like it or not. I think it's important for for people to kind of note that. Um, because you know that there's there's a flip side to the um, to everything that's kind of come with the success that they found this year. Yeah, his his ability to kind of like make the make his audience feel like they are you know almost part of the podcast is I think what has really helped um, help that show to to skyrocket. And, and like you said, when when he's at game day and he's interacting with the fans and stuff like that, like all all of those type of things help um and i i do think where where a lot of our criticism stems from is more so like you said that the power that that show has especially now that it's gone to espn and i think a, a lot of what we what we have questioned is more the fit at espn which i know he's he complains about some of the coverage that he gets now, but at the same time, if anybody asked him two years ago, would that podcast fit at ESPN? He would have said, absolutely not. So now that it's at ESPN and people kind of point out the reasons why it, it, it is a, a strange fit. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of that, uh, that criticism is, is just like, personally, I don't, I don't necessarily fault him for going to ESPN. Um, I, I don't fault him for not changing his show since going to ESPN, just like I, I don't fault Rob Deerdeck for being the reason that there's no more music on MTV either. Um, that's, that's a decision that comes from executives above. And I, I think similarly, people chose to bring, e bring McAfee onto ESPN for, for what he is. And he is, sticking to what he is and what that show is at least for now i'm curious to see how it lasts going forward but for now the show is has remained unchanged since um since going to espn um our our top media story of the year was kevin brown's suspension from the baltimore orioles for essentially complimenting the orioles on their improved record against the uh the tampa bay rays and andrew you you broke that story um your thoughts on now like looking back on that story and the fact that it was uh was voted the sports media story of the year yeah um obviously i broke that with ben and sean who did a, a great job on that as well and i really do think that the kevin brown story was the most notable thing that happened in the sports media landscape this year and i believe the reason for that is how much of an impact it made across the media world and not we saw just about every mlb broadcaster weigh out on that which was incredible you don't see that that amount of prominent people agree on just about anything but they all agreed basically that this was incredibly overtopped from the orioles and not just i think what really stood out about this story was 
this was not just a story about the Orioles and their relationship with their broadcaster. It was something that has re repercussions for every level of broadcast of, if you're not allowed to say this without a very simple factual fate, without even a lot of criticism attached to it, if you're not allowed to say that on the air, whether it's a team broadcast or on a league broadcast, that's going to have major implications for how our sports are covered. And it's going to have major implications for everybody, including the fans watching them at home. I think that's why we saw such backlash to it from uh, from fans. We saw it from broadcasters in baseball. We saw it from media people outside of baseball. And it really led to an incredible um, galvanizing of a movement and to the Orioles essentially out in the end, admitting they were wrong and bringing him back. Ben, your thoughts on that story? Well, I'm here sitting on pins and needles waiting for that Orioles investigation that the <laughs> owner talked about, John Angelos, on, on what happened there. Because John Angelos said what happened to Kevin Brown was wrong, and they were going to investigate how his suspension happened. And I'm, I'm like, waiting. I'm waiting for the findings here. Um, that was a tremendous story. Andrew and Sean and myself worked that and we, we did so efficiently. And it, uh, I think the thing that I will remember about the stories, a, just the support Kevin Brown got and B we found the video clip that got him suspended and people would watch it multiple times trying to figure out what he did to get suspended. It was so innocuous. Um, and so, you know, you, you have to be very thin skinned, um, incredibly thin skinned and just an idiot. Um, and I feel bad for people in the Orioles organization uh, because this was all, no one, everyone there had their hand tied. This clearly came from above from an ownership level. And um, you know, they went from yelling at us and other people who covered this to uh, you know, saying it was a fake story to, finally admitting the suspension and, and getting that, that, you know, that juicy investigation going. Um, so I, I think there was the, the support really kind of odd me. We made a compilation video. Um, I'm sure some, you can find it uh, of all the people who kind of stood by Kevin Brown. And I was, uh, you know, I, I, I thought it was really great to see that. And I'm glad he was back on the air and I hope going forward for him, he's, um, you know, respected and supported and, and um, you know, I, I think he has a bright future. Yeah. I, I think the, uh, well, that, all, that also got um, the, the best um, sports media moment. The, that was the, the broadcasters rallying around Kevin Brown that won our best sports media moment as well, which I think um, we, we all agree. That was uh, really cool to see the way everybody came out and was, was so willing to speak out against the Orioles and, and what happened to uh, to Kevin there? Um, and I, I I do think uh, you guys deserve plenty of credit for also doing your diligence and 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 looking into that because Im immediately after that clip went out, I mean, it was met with everybody just kind of saying like, no, this this can't be the reason why Kevin Brown is suspended. There has to be like there there's got to be another another clip there. Um, so, Sean, how surprised were you when this story came to us and you saw the clip and like this is actually the reason that Kevin Brown com coming out and reading a statistic comparing the Orioles record to the Rays in the last few seasons to what it has been this season, um, that that statistic got Kevin Brown suspended by the Orioles? Yeah, I remember I think it was like the first six hours or so after the story broke, uh, there were a lot of people kind of coming at us and being like, no, this isn't, this can't be real. And you guys are missing something. And uh, they just, just people could not believe it. Understandably. I think we all felt that way. Um, and <laughs> so I, I really enjoyed watching that progression of there's gotta be more to this. Th that was the other aspect of it. Of, there's gotta be more to this. Kevin Brown must have said something terrible or like behind the scenes or like there's some scandal that's about to break. And it was like, no, it really is this simple. And, and it was such a I mean, you know, it was a reminder of how thin skinned um, some very wealthy people can be, especially in the sports world. 
um, when it comes to, you know, innocuous things like this. I mean, who I, I can't imagine anyone other than uh, the presumed person who who made the suspension happen even noticed that moment when Kevin Brown said it. Uh, it was such a throwaway. And anything, if anybody noticed it, they were they were probably like, oh, cool. Yeah, well, we're as Orioles fans, we're doing better against the Rays. That's really good. That's that's a positive thing. Um, so the fact that it was perceived as a negative tells you so much about that mindset. Um, but yeah, it, it was really fun to kind of watch that. And, and, you know, there, there was a bit of a, I feel like for me, at least there was a little bit of a nervous energy at first of like, so many people seem confused. It was like, do, are we missing something? Like, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like we did, but, um, and then finally some other people or some other outlets, uh, I think maybe the athletic and, and some other folks kind of came forward and, uh, you know, confirmed the reporting and, uh, and then, and then it was just the, the free for all of, major league announcers, you know, bashing the Orioles, which, uh, yeah, was, was really something to see. How about you, Andrew? Was there any sort of like sense of relief when you started to see other outlets confirming, confirming the story there? I think definitely. And I, I think that's a good thing to note with these sort of stories in general. A, a lot of time people get wrapped up in who's first. There's a huge amount of value to confirming a story and to, to making it that it's not just this one media outlet out there on the wall. I think a lot of people did very good reporting on the, the Kevin Brown situation and continue to do so throughout the, the whole time he was away from the booth. And that, I think, played a big role in his eventual return. Um, moving on through the uh, the awards, I, I thought the, the best game analyst of the year was interesting. Uh, that went to Greg Olson. And I, I, I think... It's only going to get more interesting next year if he is replaced by Tom Brady or if he's coaching the Carolina Panthers. But Olsen did a, a great job this past year taking over for Troy Aikman, calling a Super Bowl, all while Tom Brady's presence has been kind of looming over him. Um, ben, we'll start with you. Your your thoughts on Olsen kind of overcoming the odds to to have a great year and, and win win best color commentator of 2023. Yeah, I feel like Greg's just been consistent and not over the top. And I feel like with Collinsworth and uh, Romo, um, you know, then probably not as much Aikman unless he's like hating the officials, which happens from time to time. Like, I think people like that he's just kind of sharp and doesn't um, doesn't really do too much or get too kind of <clears throat> energetic at times. <clears throat> I was saying that my mom thought he was a great analyst and she always complains about announcers. She then rescinded that a couple weeks later because he was horsing around. But then I we later figured out that she had watched the commercial where he has Terry Bradshaw's hair and she thought that was like a live moment and that he wasn't like – he was foregoing his announcing responsibilities. Um, yeah, I, I think he's won people over. I think people kind of want to watch the game, and they like it when someone can guess the plays, but they don't like it when, you know, there's just a lot of additional kind of commentary that isn't helpful uh, or entertaining. And I think he has a little bit more of a less is more um, approach. And, yeah, what this is a totally kind of insane scenario that he's like – one of the most well-liked people in his profession and he's been already named to be replaced. So <clears throat> does that happen? Um, does he go somewhere else? Uh, it's a weird situation. Um, I, I thought that the chances of Brady actually coming over uh, were lower than people thought. I know other people have forecasted it as 50, 50, Someone very well connected at Fox told me I would expect Tom Brady to come over and for this to actually happen, uh, largely because uh, if you're a succession watcher, uh, you know, you'll appreciate this. Um, uh, Lachlan Murdoch did the deal, which is, you know, the, the new head of Fox and uh, Rupert Murdoch's chosen successor. So, there's no one there to kind of like go like, hey, this is ridiculous. Like Greg Olson is the most beloved uh, game analyst. This makes no sense. We have to 
undo this somehow and maybe put Tom in a different role. Um, it's Lachlan Murdoch steel. So no one's, no one's going to do that was what I was kind of told to expect. Yeah. I, I guess, uh, CBS should consult your mom on, uh, Tony Romo's apparent lack of, um, preparation in, in recent years on, on his games. Um, do you do you think that if if Brady does come then do you, do you think it would make sense to put Olsen in that booth or do you think it makes sense to just just have it be Brady and Burkhart do you think it makes sense to keep Burkhart and Olsen together and and put somebody else in there in the lead booth with Brady I think uh Olsen would be like don't demote my man uh you know Kevin over here you know, move on, uh, you know, so I, I think behind the scenes agents are talking and some type of solution is going to come out of this and whether it's Tom Brady in some weird role, um, you know, or, or Olsen going elsewhere, that would be my other kind of po- like things work themselves out. Like Jason Wynn magically ended up back in football when things weren't working out. Uh, Drew Brees got, had like a, a multi-year deal that was going to pay him a ton. And when he had one bad year, they like they had a joint like you know Drew's looking forward to doing other things. What the hell is Drew Brees doing? I don't even know. Like things get done behind the scenes, and agents take care of it, and hands get washed. And I don't see Greg Olson back in the number two role, so you know I think I think it's possible to look out for him doing some other things, but. Um, I think it's going to be tough for, to keep him and Tom Brady happy. Um, so we'll see. Andrew, what do you think about uh, Greg Olson getting that award from us and also just his his future and um, kind of standing with Fox going forward? I think to me the most interesting thing out of it is Greg Olson and Kevin Burkhart. Their success validates the developmental strategy with announcers. Uh, Greg uh, Greg Olson did not come in as the number one guy. He came in on the number two team with Burkhart. Kevin Burkhart worked his way up through the ranks at Fox. And to me it's very interesting to see that at Fox where on their studio shows in particular, they have done the let's go get the big splashy name from elsewhere. Let's get the Skip Bayless. Let's get the Colin Coward. This was a very uh, within the ranks developmental approach. That's what we've seen from ESPN more often in the past on the studio shows. But ESPN is going very different now with, as we already talked about with McAfee. They're now bringing in people who already have platforms, they already have brands. And that's what they did with Monday Night Football, bringing in Buck and Aikman, who would become stars at another network. So to me, I, I like seeing what Burkhard and Olsen have done. I think it's very positive to see the, the praise they're getting for what they've done. And I think it shows the value of, not necessarily just hiring the Tony Romo or the Tom Brady, the biggest name out there, and immediately throwing them into the fire. I think there's a lot to be said for let's give people some reps, let's let them build some chemistry, and then they'll really shine when they do hit the big stage. And Sean, your uh, your thoughts on Olsen? Yeah, kind of just to piggyback um, what Ben and Andrew said, I, I when I think about how, you know, we write a lot during the week, especially on game days, when an announcer makes a flub or um, they make a weird noise, you know, a, a Tony Romo esque whatever noise he's making that week, and um, or, or it's just something that that rubs people the wrong way. I can't really think of a time we really wrote about Olson in in, in that way, and there really is something to be said for that, um, you know, because I think sometimes the you know the things about hate, hated announcers and, and analysts gets a little bit overblown. Um, you know, people just like to not like people sometimes, but I really don't get an overwhelming sense with that, with Olsen. And, and, you know, again, I think that's to his credit that he, he, he's a very steady hand. And, um, you know, sometimes in the world of announcing, that's kind of all you need to be. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, and then in terms of, you know, where they all go from here, I, I, I agree that, you know, on, uh, on paper, it makes so much sense. You know, Fox built up this this broadcasting duo to be kind of their the voice of their NFL uh, coverage for the next decade plus. Um, but like Ben said, when when the the guy at the top brings in Tom Brady, you you got Tom Brady. Um, as for how that works out, 
I truly, I mean, the, just until we know what Tom Brady is like in a booth, like we, that's really what, like, I think we'll know within like the first 10 minutes of the first game, like, okay, this is going to work or, oh, this is going to be a disaster. And um, there's going to be so much pressure on, on Brady and, and, and on Fox for that to go well. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like if it, if it's not a, if it's not clicking, we, we could see that, that changing, you know, and shifting, like Ben was saying pretty quickly. Yeah. And I also just like, even, even if Brady is good in the booth, is he going to be $375 million worth of good, especially when you, they already now have a lead booth in Burkhart and Olsen that fans generally enjoy listening to. Um, and, and then just the fact that uh, is, is Brady going to be worth it? Is, is, does it make sense to, to bump Olsen out of that booth? And you already kind of had with, by, by bringing, by signing Brady to a contract, I think it, it put so, gave so much more attention to the, the Burkhart and Olsen booth that like, did they already get the value, um, that they needed out of kind of linking themselves with Brady? Because without Brady, I, I don't know if Olsen and Burkhart get the same attention that they do over the last two seasons. And then now at this point, being that they've already gotten that attention and fans have grown to like them, like, do they still need to bring in this $375 million analyst um, to that booth? So I'm, I'm very curious to see what, uh, what happens next season. Uh, something else that we, we write a lot about is the, uh, the debate shows um, best sports debate personality went to Stephen A. Smith uh, best debate show went to first take and the worst sports debate personality went to skip Bayless. Um, I will, I will start with skip who I voted for, which for me, that was, that vote was less about his ability as a host, as an entertainer or his ability to debate even. And it, it was much more about, for this year at least, the fact that it, it felt like he pushed Shannon Sharp off of Undisputed and the show is now currently worse off for it. Um, the show might get better going forward. Um, it might build chemistry with um, with Michael Irvin and Keyshawn Johnson and Richard Sherman and Lil Wayne uh, joining in regularly. But for now, Undisputed is... is undisputedly worse than what it was when it had Shannon Sharp. And I think there's, there's a lot less passion. There is much less of those heated debates that the show kind of became known for. It's not nearly as entertaining or, or even primed to gain the traction on social media that it did when it was skip versus Shannon every single day. And they, they kind of tried to go the route of first take by mixing in the different personalities, like I mentioned, but um, Stephen A. Smith is, is much better at that. He's, he's much more uh, welcoming to that because he is more of a well-rounded entertainer. Like he, he is funny. He can banter about different topics. And then I think every time that skip Bayless tries to be funny, it, it's it's awkward. It's uh, it's cringy even like when you look at those videos that he has of him throwing the Dallas Cowboys jerseys in the trash after they lose. Like it's just it's very uncomfortable to watch. It doesn't fit him. So I'm interested to see how they can try to fix or improve upon this. And then just the fact that at at 71 years old as 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 much of a great sports media career or I'd say a prominent sports media career that Bayless has had, like how much longer does FS1 want to, to make skip the focal point of their network? So that, that was all my reasoning for voting for uh, skip Bayless as the, the worst debate personality. So um, Ben, we'll start with you. Do you want to chime in on best sports debate personality, Stephen A. Smith, worst skip Bayless, best show first take uh, I'd say, take your pick there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think how – how it seems like ages ago where, like, Stephen A. Smith, I think he had a, a thing where he wanted Shohei Otane to speak in English was a thing that he brought up. And then, like, yeah. Max crushed him, 
And then, like, the next day, he had to sit there and everyone, like, shit on him that came on the first take. It was like he went to, like, HR training. On camera. And then, yeah, and Max was disappeared from the show. And, you know, I think everyone was, like, was down on Stephen A at that moment, you know. Um, and, and, you know, they adjusted to what he wanted. And I think people kind of saw that as entitled or just kind of a power play but like we look where we are now and you know the Cr- chris russo is going viral pretty with pretty good regularity for positive things his whole i'm a big fan of when he's talking about like doing edibles and gummies marcus spears is like you know a lot of people's stock has gone up and Stephen a is a part of that and he facilitates a lot and i gotta say molly is pretty good on that you know like there are a lot of people coming in and they're hitting their notes and they're playing their role. Um, and and the show kind of glides a little bit better. I think, I think it's widened from these two people are going to debate to like, let, let's have some fun talking about sports and, you know, undisputed, undisputed has tried that, but I, you know, it takes a while to get that chemistry. And, and I think like the ratings haven't been great. I think, Shannon Sharp was probably underappreciated from how many people were tuning in to watch Shannon Sharp. Um, I think a lot of people, including myself, thought that, you know, he was more of a Robin to Skip Bayless's Batman. But, you know, with him removed, the ratings tell a different story. And, um, you know, there's kind of a rule that you don't change too much during football season. But I think Fox is probably not feeling great about how that show has performed from kind of a creative standpoint or a rating standpoint. So um, kind of a tale of uh, two shows and networks um, making some changes. And one, it seems to have come out okay. And the other one, I think, is still kind of searching for its audience and consistency. Andrew, any any thoughts on the, the current state of the debate show format? Yeah, I think the really interesting thing to me is the Shannon Sharp move of him flipping from Fox to ESPN. And, no, and obviously there was there was some pushing there, but it like it feel it felt very like Game of Thrones or so on to me. If all of a sudden this key guy on the one side is now overworking for this other team, and what's really interesting to me there too is just the history of this because like fox put so much on undisputed uh, they came in of we're we're taking on first take we're going to be better than first take we've got the guy who used to go head to head with with uh, Stephen a they never hit that height but they were running a, a reasonable second they were a reasonable competitor for a while especially once shannon sort of found his own voice and you had people who preferred that chemistry in that take and i think and i think that they particularly stepped um stood out well during the era of it being Stephen a and max kellerman on first take which we've discussed ad nauseum, but everyone involved had plenty of problems with it, didn't really think the format was great. They have very different debating and arguing styles. And so it's fascinating to me to see this go from ESPN being on top, but not dominating and Fox being a respectable number two to this shift where all of a sudden first take is maybe the strongest it's been in years, certainly with ratings, maybe creatively as well. And Fox has really just fallen down. Yeah, I don't I don't think there's a, a show that goes by where Stephen A. Smith doesn't mention being number one for the last 12 years. Um, and I, I still I don't know exactly what he's referring to, because first take has definitely not beaten cable news networks um, during those those hours for the last 12 years. So maybe he's he's only comparing himself to um, to other sports debate shows, which like, I guess. All right, then he, he wins that. Uh, but every single day he he's he's out there touting his ratings and at least in the the last couple of months he certainly has uh been able to enjoy seeing first take kind of continue to take off whereas uh skip's show has has started to um revert back a little bit since uh since losing shannon uh sean your thoughts on the debate shows yeah i i look at it from the point of view you know, I'm not someone who really enjoys watching either of those shows, uh, but I can appreciate what First Take is doing uh, from an entertainment standpoint. 
Um, and actually, my vote for best sports uh, debate show personality was Chris Russo, because I feel like personally, I am so much more aware of when he is on that show. And I know something wild is going to happen. There is going to be a clip that we're going to pull and people are going to go nuts and it's going to go viral. And, you know, I totally understand Chris Russo and Stephen A. Smith is not, they're not everybody's cup of tea, but you can't deny the entertainment value. And I think they have, they, and uh, you know, the other people on the show, they have a really good understanding of how it's entertainment regardless of how you feel about it, regardless of whether or not you feel like the debate itself is worthwhile. Um, juxtapose that with Skip and Undisputed. And honestly, I forget that show exists most of the time. Um, uh, you know, every once in a while, Richard Sherman will say something or Keyshawn Johnson will react to something that, that someone says. And like, but I can't, I can't even think of the last time Skip Bayless did something of note uh, on that show other than being like, uh, you know, overwhelmed by his his new co-host. Um, and I, I think that's that's kind of it right there is, you know, and, and I know this isn't what we're talking about, but I think if you look at their, they have their own podcasts now. And like Stephen A. Smith's podcast is wild. Like he is just talking about everything and anything. And he has crazy opinion, or not crazy, you know, he has like out there opinions and he's, you know, you, 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 even if you don't, you're not interested in it, you're, you're like engaged with what he's doing. If you watch Skip Bayless's podcast, he looks like he's being held at gunpoint. Yeah. And like, uh, well, I, no, and it, also Skip, Skip's podcast is almost an extension of the show where he's still talking about the Cowboys and the Lakers and LeBron James for, yeah. for two more hours. Except now, rather than having anybody to discuss it with or argue against, he is by himself in a room reading the entire thing word for word off of uh, sheets of paper. And it, it just it completely lacks any sort of juice. Whereas Stephen A. Smith, like you do kind of tune in or or at least you scroll through his Twitter feed looking for for clips to see, like, what is the craziest thing that he said today? Because he seems to he has a, a little bit of that. um like shock jock uh, Howard Stern factor in which like, I think he goes into a show saying like, well, how am I going to outdo what I, I did on my, my last episode? And then he manages to say something even crazier. Um, any, anybody else have any thoughts on any of the specific topics? Uh, is there, is there anything that somebody wants to in a ward that someone wants to mention or, or discuss before we uh, move on. I would just uh, a quick shout out for the most overblown story, which is one I wrote up. And this was about Disney's will they or won't they with selling off ABC. I, I think this ties into a really interesting larger part of the media landscape right now of that broadcast television is becoming so important in sports with accelerating cord cutting with the decline of bundles. And we're seeing that on a whole lot of levels. We're seeing it with the RSN collapse. We're seeing deals being struck with broadcast stations there. Uh, we're seeing it in talk about the big consolidation of like one of the big barriers to Paramount being bought by a Disney or a Comcast is what happens with that broadcast network and how, how does that work from an antitrust thing. And we're seeing it with how many sports are getting put on these networks. And we saw it in a huge way this fall with the Monday night football simulcast over on ABC, which kicked off everyone in the distributor space. So uh, to me, the Bob Iger's comments on ABC were fascinating. And if they had turned out to be an actual thing that would have been seismic that would have undone so much of what Disney has been working towards it would have completely changed the landscape of ESPN and where they put their big sports events and eventually Iger walked it back and was like no yeah I was just uh, trying it to see, to see what happens but it was really interesting to follow that and for all the discussions that spawned and really showing off the importance that broadcast networks have today uh, the one thing I'll say is I think 2023 is an interesting year <clears throat> for a lot of reasons on the media front, but I think college football as a sport is going to feel really different next year. Uh, we have the year two of like the Big Ten with NBC and CBS, but four new schools are coming over. The Pac-12 is gone. The playoff is now going to be 12 teams. 
So, so many games are just not going to feel as important, including the conference championship games. Um, it, I think I think it's just going to be co- – college football is going to feel significantly different next year. Um, and I think that's going to take a little bit of time for us to wrap our heads around. Um, and I think, I think it's great that NBC and CBS are kind of maintaining a, a presence in the sport. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's going to be real interesting how, you know, I think on Saturday you could see like, oh, Alabama's losing at halftime to a team and you'd be like, I got to watch that. They're going to be eliminated from, you know, contention. And now, you know, it's like, who cares? Um, so I think that's going to be kind of an interesting thing. And the SEC without CBS football, ESPN's first year where they're all in on the SEC and have all of the games. Um, kind of the gamesmanship between Fox and ESPN between Big Noon and uh, College Game Day and just in general, the kind of PR needling that takes place. I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be a whole whole another world starting next year. Yeah, and I think what I'll add. Um, so we did awfully for the best scripted sports TV show of the year and, and also the best documentary slash docuseries. And it was a real tale of, um, you know, where the the industry is, go- it is not even where it's going, where it is. Um, in terms of scripted shows, it really was just between the last season of Ted Lasso and what became the last season of Winning Time. Um, and Ted Lasso won the award for us, and I, I think it could have gone either way. But though both of those shows are over. Um, Amazon canceled a league of their own. Uh, I, I believe that really – maybe the most prominent scripted sports show on television right now is all American on the CW. Um, you know, maybe if you count Cobra Kai as a, as a sports show, uh, but that's about it uh, unless I'm missing something. And so it's a really interesting time for, you know, we're, we're Friday night lights is, is long in the, in the rearview mirror. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if, if anybody steps into that space in 2024 or, or beyond. Um, meanwhile, on the docu series side, we were we had so many nominations internally. Uh, it, what a year for uh, sports docu series! Uh, you know, with all the streaming services kind of tapping into that. Netflix, you know, having so much success with that. Uh, but but across the board, Amazon, Max, uh, Showtime, you name it. Uh, and you know, I think we can debate the merits of um, authenticity in some of those docu series and you know, how separate it, they were from their subject. Uh, but there's no denying that it's, it really is kind of the golden age of the uh, sports docu-series right now. Um, so, you know, that seems like an area, even as things are changing coming out of the writer's strike, that seems like an area where um, we're going to continue to see a lot of interesting stuff. All right. Great stuff. Thank you guys. Um, for, for everyone listening, be sure to check out awfulannouncing.com for all of the, Awfully, I, I think there were 20 different uh, categories that um, uh, we voted on and, and that that won awards. So definitely a, a lot more to check out on the site and then stay tuned for the rest of the podcast, which will feature uh, best of clips from um, interviews that we had dating back to April. Thanks for listening. What do you think about Stephen A. Smith starting to pivot a little bit in, into politics and the new podcast that he has? Um, I mean, if that's what he wants to do, I haven't really listened to the podcast. I've heard, you know, some of the snippets um, that they put online, but I don't see any reason for him not to do that. And I think, I mean, we've known this for a long time about Stephen A. His ambitions have always been bigger and grander yeah. than sports. And, you know, it's a kind of a new world order um, at the company with them allowing people to do things that are outside of the company or allowing him to do a podcast like that. Um, And so I wish him the best on it. I'm interested. I mean, he has talked about having, you know, people approaching him about going into politics. I would not be surprised at all to see him actually do it like like that. In fact, I may be more surprised, I mean, more surprised than not if he were to not go into politics really at this point, look, man, he's really, really, really famous. Like, I, I don't think that's something that can really easily be explained to people. It's just what the magnitude of Stephen A. Smith is at this point in time. And if he decided to run, I would not be terribly surprised. I don't have any idea whether or not he could win. I don't know where he would run. I don't know any of those things, but it wouldn't shock me at all. If he decided he wanted to run for office. 
is that something though that do you think he would have to start at like a local level in running for office or or right. uh, how something? local are you talking? Uh, I don't, I mean, like, could you see him running for running for governor? Like, I I don't I don't know that. I could. Uh, oh, really? I could see him doing that. I don't know if that would be the wisest idea necessarily. Right, right. right. Yeah, but I sure. could see him doing that. I could see him running jumping for the house. right into something like that. Yeah, like I could see him running for the house. Like, but he moves like. A politician, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but he moves like a man that knows that everybody's looking at him and that when he talks, everybody sits up and listens. And so I, I'm more of a competition fan. I love to watch uh, teams compete. And I, I tell you, I just texted Michael Malone. He's a, a buddy of mine, the head coach of the Denver Nuggets. Um, just I love as skilled as Nikola Jokic is, as skilled as uh, Jamal Murray is and and uh, KCP and, and all the rest of the guys, dude, I love their, their mental toughness. There's no, there's no question in my mind, especially in the NBA where the NBA is softer than whale poop. Um, you know, guys, I mean, guys are drama just totally. I, I just looked at Tatum. I was like, you're Ben Roethlisberger, like the, you know, on that ankle. I, I'm sure it's hurt. I'm sure your ankle really hurts. I, I, I get it. But don't be a drama queen about it. I, I was expecting him to come out in one clown shoe, you know, taped up. He's like, yeah, you see how big my shoe is? I had to wear a clown shoe. My ankle's so small. And I got so much tape on it. If you can't play, get out or just play well. That My rule is you got to play hurt. You got to play injured. But you got to play well hurt. And you got to play well injured. And if you can't, then get out. And so, you know, if you're not tough enough to play well injured, then get out. I don't need to see you limping around and grimace face and, oh, look how hurt I am. Oh, you know, I mean, it's an excuse in the writing. And I'm probably way off base and people are going to be pissed at me. But, again, I don't really give a crap. Um, so I, I, I told Michael Malone, I go, you know, the thing that impresses me about your team is not the skill levels. The talent is wasted on talented people. There's plenty of talented people that ain't worth a crap. Um the mental and physical toughness, there's no coincidence in my mind that the two most mentally and physically tough basketball teams are in the NBA Finals. Was it hard going to Miami, leaving Cleveland, a, a franchise where you had already built relationships and connections, and now you're thrown into a new city to cover a different team, and, and you're doing it for a national outlet also, not as opposed to a, a local newspaper or something like that? Was there animosity from other beat reporters who had been there for years? There was animosity from LeBron. <laughs> he did not. He was not crazy about it. He um, uh, he didn't like the way ESPN handled the fallout from the decision. He felt like he got left alone on an island there. Uh, none of this is new information. I mean, this has been said for years. Um, and he really didn't like the idea of ESPN creating a team of people just to cover the heat, which was kind of revolutionary at the time, which I was the lead guy on. Um, and it was pretty uh, salty the first year. I mean, if I say anything that was difficult about it, obviously moving, I had never lived away from Northeast Ohio. I went to college in Northeast Ohio, and I mean, I'm from Akron, but I was living in Cleveland <clears throat> for those seven years. So, you know, it's, it's a 45-minute drive. I was still basically at home. So, yeah, it was, it was a challenge to move away from home, uh, I, but I was like 30 how old was I? I was 32. I mean, I was a grown adult. It was fine. But, um, you know, the thing that was frustrating was that I was um, I was branded as a sycophant for going. Um, and I was down here in Miami where I am right now for the finals. And like LeBron was like not giving me the time of day. <laughs> so like if I was going to be branded a sycophant, at least I would get the benefits of being a sycophant, right? Like, you know, I would, I'd be getting all the inside information and all the special access, but I wasn't. Um, so that was a little bit frustrating, but again, I mean, like at the end of the day, who cares? You know, who cares? It's part of, uh, it's part of the deal. It's part of what you sign up for. And, you know, when you become a higher profile person, you face scrutiny. Um, you know, like, when it, it, when you when you you know when you become an NBA player, and you accept all of the benefits that come along with being an NBA player, it means that people are going to criticize you. When you become a national face that covers a high profile league like the NBA, people are going to criticize you. It is part of the deal. Uh, if you don't like it, you can leave the NBA. If I didn't like it, I could leave ESPN. There's nobody. I haven't been forced into this. Um, I think it's a little bit. I don't. I don't think it has great perspective. But again, just like I would say about the aggregation, 
I would think that the NBA players who are criticized by people in the media or evaluated or reported on by people in the media probably think that we don't have the best perspective and we get it wrong sometimes. So I think, you know, it's part and parcel of, uh, of doing it. So um, it was a bit of an adjustment when I first came to Miami, but now it's just a part of life. And um, I'm, you know, one of the things I'll say about LeBron that I feel pretty good about, he seems to be truly happy. He seems to be truly in a happy place. Maybe not when they lose in the in the playoffs, or maybe not when um, they have a bad season, as they've had a couple in LA. But it, my read on him is that he is a reasonably happy guy. And I, me personally, I I live a pretty happy life. And so um, there's a lot of people in the NBA who do extraordinarily well financially, have this great life, and they're not happy. So I think if you can achieve happiness in the profession, whatever profession you're in, you're ahead. It would be probably the most important thing I could say to somebody who's starting out in the profession, find a job that makes you happy. It sounds basic and stupid, and I would have ignored it when I was 18, but I think it's kind of true. And I think LeBron's found it, and I know I have. And so, um, you know, if it means you get criticized every now and then, and that's fine. That first year being a little rocky in Miami um, covering the Heat and LeBron, do you, do you think that was more so because of some like animosity towards ESPN or was it just the fact that you went to Miami to cover the Heat? Like, Would there have been an issue, do you think, if you got a job with the Miami Herald? No, I think it was in – for me it was in Cleveland where I had enjoyed basically um, a, um, a stress-free ride. I was covering – a team that was extremely popular and for years had generally had nothing but good news. I mean, you know, they had some defeats in the playoffs and stuff, but you know, in, you know, in relatively medium sized Cleveland, uh, I enjoyed a um, very positive Q rating. And then again, this is a place where I was born and raised. Um, and so, you know, most of the stuff I was reporting on was positive, you know, that 60 win Cavs team was doing great. You know, I wasn't, you know, having to, I mean, I would criticize the team when I had to and criticize personnel moves and, but you know, nothing was too severe. And then the city got hit with one of the worst, um, setbacks in sports. I say one of, because, you know, when I was 17, they lost the Browns. So one of the worst, you know, blows in the history of the sports of the city, which in a lot of cases defines the the, the, the soul of the city. Um, it's not like, you know, a river catching on fire, for example, but, you know, it felt that way to a lot of folks. And I became a sort of a, a secondary symbol of that. And um, so I wasn't used to it. Uh, I, I mean, I had a public Facebook page in 2010. <laughs> you know, where like people could comment on it and my family mm. would see it. And, you know, that was fine. That was no problem. You know, it was just, a, you know, everything part of life. And I had to shut it down because I didn't want my family members to see what people were saying about me. And I literally have not been on Facebook since 2010. I had to get off because, uh, because of that sort of stuff. And it, I don't think it was personal, but I was somebody that they could get, you know, get to in a way and have vitriol. And so, but again, in the grand scheme of things, it's not like, uh, you know, the Ukraine war, <laughs> you know, I mean, is, you know, it, I, I received some nasty things that people said to me in public and, you know, people shot spitballs at me when I would come to games and I had to shut down, you know, various aspects of social media. It, you know, it, at the end of the day, it wasn't, it was fine. There's no problem, but you know, it was definitely an adjustment period. And, um, you know, that's just part of life. You know, it's, you know, it, but again, if you're going to take all that flack for being a sycophant, at least get the positive side, the, the positive aspects of being a sycophant. I didn't get the positive aspects <laughs> of being a sycophant because I was making, I was doing a job. So that was the only thing that ever really was, was frustrating. When you returned to WFAN three years ago, mm -hmm could you have foreseen walking away on your own terms this soon? And is there, is there even like a, a sense of accomplishment that you were able to walk away on your own after the way things ended previously the first time in 2017? Well, my sense of accomplishment was coming back, you know, to WFA and having that opportunity. Um, and that, that'll always stand out to me with great pride that although my wounds are all self-inflicted, you know, I was away from radio for three years, which is a very long time. And to come back to WFAN in a different time slot with different people 
and have the level of success that we had, you know, that's the thing that I'm really proud of. Uh, I never thought about anything beyond just hope, hoping you would have the chance to come back and earn a living doing what I love to do. Anything beyond that is obviously gravy. Um, and I will never forget the opportunity you know, that fan gave me and the success that we had together. It's been great. It was great. You hosted up close for a few years uh, when you were with ESPN. And, and I'd say the most famous interview that you did was OJ Simpson in 1998. Was that also the hardest interview of your career? Yes, that, that was definitely, uh, and it was controversial, not from the sense that I was going to do it when we had the opportunity, but I think some people, even at ESPN, even in our own company, were like, why, why do you want to put that guy on the air? You know what I mean? We've already, and I was like, well, because I'm, well, I'm certainly not going to talk football with him. I, uh, you know, I told him when, when he wanted to come on and he wanted to come on. I mean, he's, he, he said, because I've watched this, we, first of all, we were trying to get him on years before all of this, this, this happened with uh, the alleged double murder and uh which the evidence was was overwhelming and then the wrongful death lawsuit but uh, so that'll have then then he's years after that not years but it was i think a little bit after that second trial yeah that he's his attorney said hey you know, he, he's willing to come on but it's two two conditions you have to do it live and you can't ask about his children and he said you know oj thinks chris is fair and wants to come so i think and we were glad to do it and meet those conditions but i said i have to ask whatever i want to ask um but but uh, uh, you know I, I i thought it was a good thing for people to see him in a live situation i think barbara walters was supposed to get that first live interview but he didn't uh, i'm sorry that first interview but she wouldn't do it live and okay. he wouldn't do it unless it was live because he didn't want to be edited um so uh yeah and i i had to prepare differently than sports uh, you know legal material and uh court documents and, and I, I met with you know prosecutors and police and defense attorneys so that i would at least in in that amount of time be be prepared uh for how he would respond to certain things and so that i asked the questions that that people wanted to know after all, watching we were all glued to the trial and 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 post comments and things like that but uh yeah it was it was it was one of the greatest challenges i would say in uh you know in in, in the business that i've ever had to run into uh, and and during that interview, you had you asked OJ if he was capable of of killing someone, and I think that was a it was a, a telling question, and it was like it was a little bit chilling to even hear it with with something that bold. Like, do you almost have to build confidence during the conversation to be able to ask a question like that, or is that something going into the interview that you know that you're you're going to ask that? Yeah, I, I had some things I wanted to cover. And, and, you know, again, the most important thing in doing an interview is listening to what they're saying and following up. And if you go back, you can watch the interview on YouTube and yeah. you'll see there's some contentious moments. But you're right about that. That question was one. I, I, I knew Brandon, he wasn't going to come out. Well, I didn't know, but I figured he wasn't going to come out and say, hey, I did it. You know, you yeah. can whatever, but double jeopardy. Again. But but I, I wanted to have a question it's not a gotcha question, but where people at home could see his reaction on what he said, I would, and again, I was surprised as you said, he was so, it was, it was chilling. I mean, some of the things he said were, but I, I went in saying, I'm going to work that question in somewhere. I think it's important to, to, you know, are you capable of killing? Because he, he had been watching uh, some of the things you'd done and, and, and what went on in the court documents, uh, uh, you know, he, his stories and things were twit like searching for the real killers. Right. I mean, I was, I, I asked him like the, who can you show us give us a name of a detective private eye whoever a check you wrote something that that uh, would would prove that you're really searching other than you're out on a golf course i mean i wasn't that sarcastic but i was thinking that so yeah and i tried to be fair i mean even though when i looked at all the evidence going into this thing and and stuff that even i think the jury never got to see i mean it was overwhelming there wasn't any doubt i mean the only doubt was did he have some help in cleaning things up or doing what he what he what he did but uh yeah that was a question there were a few that i wanted and and that remember we were supposed to do a half hour live up close interview with him and, and once we got rolling i think the executives uh, the ESPN man thankfully said, Hey, let's keep going. This is, you know, we don't want to cut this short. So we ended up doing 50 or whatever, almost an hour uh, uh, type of thing, which we had a lot more to get to. Uh, uh, but, um, but I appreciated that he at least did the interview and, 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 and let people judge for themselves yeah. based on, on his answers. That was, that was kind of the goal there. You did have a Donald Trump related episode of your podcast and Talk about like making your presence felt at Metal Ark in a big way. Your first podcast episode there was essentially confronting Dan Levitard about his past interviews with Donald Trump that he 
attempted to scrub from the archives. So when, when was Dan made aware that you were working on that? Dan was never told in full what we were doing until we sat down to record it. And so Pablo Torre finds out uh, the premise of it had always been sort of twofold. Like we want to find out uh, in an investigative journalistic sense, um, but we also wanted to fuck around. Uh, apologies um, oh, okay. for, the, for the profanity. <laughs> um, but but truly, like part of it is um, we want to do stupid things seriously uh, and vice versa. And so for me, like nothing encapsulated that mission statement more than starting my new job, the thing upon which I staked the future of my family uh, <laughs> by by confronting the co-founder of said company with things that are legitimately humiliating for him. And so Dan didn't know that I had all of this stuff teed up this way. I was going to do it as a confrontation. I was going to do it by essentially diving through dumpster diving in the end, to your point about like, he wanted to throw this all out. Like right. this was not available online anywhere. Everyone had forgotten about it, which speaks again to just like the way that we're overloaded by everything. And so the fact that Dan had interviewed Donald Trump, Dan Levitard, maybe the foremost opponent of Trump when it comes to just people who can't stop talking about Trump um, in sports media. Um, the fact that that guy had Donald Trump on as a guest on his show, as a friend of the show, as a call-in guest over three years, and that, that that tape had been lost and gone until I exhumed it off of a hard drive in Miami, only to confront Dan with the truth of his past um, in ways that were, I think, both deeply introspective, but also legitimately cringe-inducing. Um, all of that is, is, is absolutely um, yeah, a dangerous way to start start your career somewhere yeah were you aware of, of how much they had spoken in the past like did did you have that in in memory that you you knew that he had interviewed him multiple times and and had him as almost a a call a frequent caller over those few years yeah so the way i stumbled upon this is where i am also complicit and guilty is that i showed up to co-host dan's radio show for the first time in 2015 in person in Miami when it was at ESPN. And that day we had a call in guest that turned out to be Donald Trump. And so I interviewed Trump with Dan and Stu Gatz on air on live ESPN radio. And at the time, my question was like, why are we doing this? And, and it was not, certainly it was not enough to not do it. Um, but I was informed that actually this happens a lot. Yeah. You know, like he, Donald Trump's a caller. Donald Trump says he loves Dan's show. Like there is tape of Donald Trump repeatedly complimenting Dan Levitard and how much he loves the show. And so ever since that, ever since that day where Dan sort of said, like, actually, he, he's a call in guest. Um, I've been obsessed with figuring out to, with finding out why, how often what you guys talk about, um, because that episode that I did with Dan in which Trump was a call in guest was the last time he ever appeared on the show, because I believe. I think it was like three weeks later, three or five weeks later. Donald Trump declared his candidacy as president of the United States. And then everything was like, oh, oh, this thing. We, we can't really do this yeah. anymore. <clears throat> well, and I guess in Dan's defense, he's he's not a, alone there. I mean, there's a, a lot of radio shows. Donald Trump was not uh, not hard to find through throughout i mean in the 80s 90s 2000s oh, or, yeah, yeah right think of the amount of time oh, that he was on howard stern and and the way stern has kind of you know alienate tried to alienate himself from from trump in the in the years since he declared his candidacy for president as well well listen that's part of the introspection here is that we are not the show pablo torre finds out is not a show that is meant to just engage in moral scolding like right. part of why I wanted to do this episode was because I wanted to reckon with how good a guest Donald Trump was. Yeah. Like he's good at sports radio. Yeah. Like Donald Trump super is super entertaining. Like the, oh, no doubt. He's funny. Like he's Donald Trump for all of the other stuff that is now obvious. I don't even need to say anymore about like caveating why he's, you know, a bad guy, blah, 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 blah. Right. The, the reality is he's an A plus sports radio gas bag. And, yeah. and I loved listening to these tapes in a way that made me think about, oh, this is his superpower. Like if you're running against Donald Trump now, right? 
the whole point is not again if you're strategizing politically like you should not be in denial about that you should not deny that donald trump is really good at being on camera being a, a character being on tv like you almost need to concede at the start of every debate i would advise at least like this guy's going to be a lot more charismatic than me. He's going to be funnier than me. You're going to like him more than you like me. He's going to seem more real. And like, go from there. Like, don't try to compete in that way. We should not be in denial about why Trump got elected. A lot of it is because he is, in fact, the guy on these tapes. And it's compelling. It's good radio. Has LeBron James contacted <laughs> Eric Spitz in an attempt to uh, to get you removed from Sirius XM yet? Not, not yet. Not that I know of. <laughs> but, you know, I hope they'll tell me if he does because those are fun conversations. <laughs> yeah, so, and for, for anybody who, who missed that, does not know, a couple years ago on your What Did I Miss podcast, you revealed oh. that LeBron attempted to get you fired from ESPN, possibly because you joined a cast of millions in, millions. in mocking the decision. Yeah. Um, were, were you made aware of his attempt as it was happening or was that something that you found out after? No, I found out after, um, in like all the chaos that ensued sort of right after I left, um, all this other information started coming out. So I kind of knew I'd gotten wind of it right as I was leaving. Uh, and then more stuff came out and I was just like, what a crap show. <laughs> Good Lord. And I, I'm, I'm sure LeBron has since apologized to you. Oh, he sent me so many flowers. How could I not forgive him? <laughs> what was it? Um, was it NBA countdown that he wanted you removed from? Yes. He wanted me replaced. And then you were eventually replaced on, on countdown by Rachel Nichols. Do you think that LeBron ended up having any influence over that decision or, or no, I mean, if he by the did, time it happened, it, it was, you know, if he did, it was short lived. Um, but you know, she did that to herself. So it's sort of one of those things where when I was on the outside watching it all crumble, it, I couldn't help but kind of laugh because I, you know, you hear things, you know, things, you're told things, and then you get to sort of stand away and watch the house burn. <laughs> you're just like, holy cow, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't know how much of it was real and how much wasn't. And, um, yeah, you know, I, he's a powerful dude. I mean, I, there's no there's no getting around that. He is an empire and an entity upon himself. And he's in, in all the respect for building such a powerful entity on, on a name and, and doing it well. Um, so, yeah, it's people are going to listen. Um, I don't think they replaced me immediately. And that that was, I guess, somebody's way of kind of having my back. But it didn't feel like it. Did you have a working relationship with Rachel Nichols before? She replaced you on countdown. Um, we were civil. Uh, some people I don't trust in this business. That's one of them. Um, after after she had audio leaked from a, a private conversation and was subsequently fired by ESPN, um, you not so subtly tweeted that karma is a bitch. Uh, yes, it is. Do you, do you think that? Rachel Nichols personally influenced your departure from countdown. Um, yeah, I do. I, okay. I mean, look, she ultimately is not that powerful, but I think some of the narrative that was being allowed to be played out, like specifically in the New York post at the time, um, you know, I knew where it was coming from. A lot of, we all knew where it was coming from and it wasn't being stopped, which is unfortunate. You know, you invest in someone time and salary and all of those things that they had done at that point to sort of just let it go because you don't want to deal with the ramifications or the, the bickering or the whining. That's not a good enough reason, but it is what it is. Um, decisions were made. Yeah. I mean, I learned a lot, but I also learned there are some things you can't control. I, I don't regret not getting down in the trough and, and slopping around in that mess. Um, maybe at the time I had thought about it more, like maybe fighting back, but it's not a good look and I've never really done my career that way. And I, I hope to never do my career that way. I, I think, your work should stand on its own and shouldn't be a bunch of backstabbing and, and stuff that goes on behind it. It's not a good way to do it. So then I have to at least ask if, if Rachel Nichols engaged in what we'll say media war games to replace you on countdown. Um, and we'll say at least somebody from Maria Taylor's camp did the same to get Nichols removed from the show. <laughs> yeah. um, Jesus. Did you did you do anything similar when you replaced Sage Steele to get the job? No. Um, and I know that that narrative was floated out there, too. It's it's a 
I didn't have to. I mean, the decisions that were made had been made. What happens is what I've learned now is that depending on what side of that story you are, you sort of can now go out and play that. So you can either you can play the victim card if that behooves you um, or you can go on the offensive, but you do it sneakily. So it's, it's just a it's just gross. And anyone who knows me knows I'm a little bit blunt and I'm a pretty honest person, but I'm also very sh short on patience. All of these games, it's it feels filthy. Like it feels dirty. And I loved the job. Like I love doing NBA countdown. It was a dream gig. And when my new, um, my new contract was coming up, that was a big part of the selling point was like, do you, what, do you want to host NBA countdown? That's going to be something you can do. I was like, absolutely. It was a dream job at the time. And then that sort of all came out. And then, and I know Sage felt very much like she'd been, um, blindsided. I wasn't told she was blindsided. Like I knew what was coming. Um, so who knows? That's a stage question. You'd have to ask her what she had heard or was told. You, you talk about things kind of changing and and not necessarily going to to plan on Sports Center. Was anchoring Sports Center with um, Bob Lee on September eleventh, two thousand one. Your would you call that your most memorable, or or we'll say that the broadcast that stands out maybe more than any any others. Yeah, and I, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I regret not mentioning that when I mentioned NFL Live and the COVID draft of 2020. Yeah, there's no question. Um, you know, Bob and I still text each other every day, every year on that day, just to you know, hey, hope you're doing well. Um, I'll never forget that day. Uh, I was, I was going out for a run, and I got called back into the house, and they said a plane just hit the trade center. I'm like, whoa, what's that going on? And then we're sitting and watching, and then the other plane hit. Like, okay, this is clearly not an accident. And as I'm leaving the house to go to work that day, uh, she yells out the window, uh, a bomb just went off at the Pentagon, which we turned out later was another plane hitting the Pentagon. I remember driving to work that day thinking, what the hell am I doing going to work today? Like, why am I, like, what's the point? What, what does anybody care about anything we have to say when we were under attack? And there was a big debate that day in the newsroom about, should we do a show? Should we not do a show? Should we cede all our time to ABC so they can have and all our channels to ABC so we can get as much coverage of this as possible? And I was definitely of the opinion that we shouldn't do a show. This, there's, what can we do that would be anything? And Bob, to his undying credit, was very adamant, said, look, I hear you. I understand that. But what we do is we report on the news as it relates to sports. And there's a lot of things that are uh, being affected in the sports world by what just happened. And I think we need to go on and, and, and do that show. And so we did, and we were just going to go on for like, I don't know, 30 minutes or something. And, but then sort of things became evolved and they said, can you and Bob stay on a little longer? Can you and Bob stay on a little longer? And I think we did a couple hours that night. And then, uh, all that week, Bob and I did shows that week. And, um, yeah, memorable is a, is an interesting, I think that's the most appropriate word because I, there's no way you'll ever forget it. Right. And, and, and I, and I want to be clear, I, I didn't, en I enjoyed it, but I didn't enjoy it. You know what I mean? Like I enjoyed Bob and I being together and doing that show. I mean, that our, I believe our intro to that sports center, that first day still runs at the museum. Uh, at oh, really? 11. Yeah. I, and you know, we, we, we taped an updated thing for them as well. So, I mean, it's a part of history now. And I, I, it was Bob made the right choice. It was it was absolutely a lot of people had different feelings, but Bob was very adamant about it. And he he was the voice of reason that day. And uh, I was very proud to do that show and those shows all that week with Bob. Yeah, obviously, you said that you you didn't want to do it, which I think was a, is certainly a fair there's a fair argument to be made that um, th at that time that you sh you shouldn't have done it. And and looking back on it, I think it's uh, it's at least good that it's something that you can look back on it and, and be proud of of those shows but what was your comfort level um in the moment of, of doing the show because sports is is supposed to be fun sports center is yeah. supposed to be entertaining here you are tasked with anchoring this sort of trivial show on in one of the worst moments in the history of the country how do you how do you make sure that you strike the right tone yeah, there was no, there wasn't a lot of laughing. I mean, yeah, there was nothing. I mean, we just wanted to try and be as clear as possible about what we knew. And you know, the big thing that week was would the NFL play that that following Sunday? And they ended up not playing. 
and and a large part of that was you know uh, the day after the Sunday after John F. Kennedy was assassinated, the NFL did decide to go on a play, and Pete Rozelle, who was the commissioner of the NFL at that time, said it was the biggest mistake he ever made in his life, and you know everybody was sort of saying I, I like I can remember on that first night. Um, you know, people were still planning on playing football games in the South that Saturday. Uh, and they were like, well, you know, this affected these people up here. It's it's not part of where we are. Uh, and then, you know, then it sort of began to this rolling effect of what what had happened. And, and um, once the NFL decided not to play that week, there was no turning back for anybody. If the NFL, which is, you know, whether you like it or not, is the biggest you know, sporting business entity in this country by a mile. If they weren't going to play, how could anybody else justify playing? So once the NFL decided they were not going to play that week, that was pretty much uh, game over for anything that was going to happen that week in any way, shape, or form. Did it seem like, did other people like working with them? Because like, I also think after, after the Skip and Shannon relationship started to deteriorate earlier this year there were there were a lot of kind of narratives out there that nobody wants to work with skip and everybody seemed more interested in in going to first take and working with Stephen a at least while while you were there did other people enjoy being on the show with them yeah i don't think anybody now i remember jalen rose had a, a problem with skip and then ultimately skip with jalen over the pistol pete water pistol pete uh comment you know this was at toward the end and and at this point I had already decided that my days here have got to be short or I'm going to quit the business. Like I've got to find something else within ESPN. So I was already there and I knew it was just a matter of weeks before I went to sports center. But I do remember the show where uh, just in the context of having a conversation, Skip had mentioned to Jalen, what have you won? You know, you and I have won the same number of NBA championships or something along those lines. And I never like it when Skip would do that. And he he did do that with a number of guys. The other guy that I remember he did that with that rubbed the wrong way was Chris Carter. Like, okay. don't tell a Hall of Famer like Chris Carter, you know, you never won anything. Right. You know, I mean, there's, there's certain things that you, there's certain things you can't say to an alpha male that has deserved all of our respect. And Chris used to hate it when he would do that. And Chris, and I know Jalen wasn't in love with it. And this particular day when he brought it up, Jalen had had enough. And he just said, Skip, is it true that you averaged 1.2 points a game your senior year in high school? Or maybe it was 2.1. I can't remember. And Skip was thunderstruck. And I was thunderstruck. I was just like, what's happening here? And Skip said, yeah. Yeah, it is. But there's a reason for that. And so he started going into this story about how the coach's son also was the point guard. And, you know, the, I mean, here we are now. now. We're discussing in front of a very large audience, Skip Bayless' his senior year in high school. Like, yeah, I knew that that was only going to end poorly. I knew it. And so then he said, you know, you know, your, your idol was Pistol Pete. Well, you're water Pistol Pete. And you could hear the voices in the control room go, oh, 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 oh. And everybody in the studio got quiet and I was in the middle of it. And I tried to graciously get us out of it and get us to a commercial break. But when we got there, it was ice in the studio. Like it was not a good scene. And um, we came to work the next day. I had some conversations with Jalen after the show. I had some conversations with Skip after the show. I'm trying to be the peacemaker. And I thought we were in a good place. And then I found out that this thing was about to go to a whole new level. I came in the next morning and I'd mentioned Jamie, who was our CP at the time. Yeah. And it had just recently taken over the show. He loved Skip. He was all in on Skip. He's at the morning meeting and he tells us, so we're going to start the show today with an uninterrupted monologue from Skip. <laughs> I'm not making this up explaining why he only averaged, you know, 2.1 points a game in, in high school. And Jalen was there, you know, Jalen was going to be there and we were going to, and I, I said immediately, we're not doing this. Like, there's no way we're going to do this. And I was told, Oh no, we're doing this. This is so important to skip that we don't know if he's going to do the show today. If we don't do this. So, 
I look, I understand Skip wanted to defend what was now his record as a, you know, I'm sure he never thought he'd be in a position to do that. And here's Jalen, a guy who, you know, was part of the Fat Five, you know, had a nice professional career. And he's involved with this show now where one of the hosts is going to explain why he only averaged 1.2 points a game. <laughs> it just was, it got out of control. I've never talked to Skip about it. I don't know how he feels about it today. He doesn't change his mind, so he's probably just as adamant that that was the right thing to do in that moment. But then came word that Skip was never, uh, Jalen was never allowed to do another first take ever again. Like it was, you know, he was a banned guest. He was banished. And at that time, Skip had that kind of power on first take because, again, the show was taken to heights we had never reached. And Skip was the guy that took us there. No question about it. And so I don't know that Skip ever gave that edict. It was just what producers on the show were telling me. Jalen's right. been on the show for the last time. Um, obviously, Jalen's ro uh, role at ESPN would only get bigger over time. You know, he ended up being part of the NBA coverage yeah. and all of that. And it, for a time, he had a very big role at ESPN. So, but but I do know that the relationship between Skip and Jalen was fractured. But I, in general, I, I got to say, Skip is one of the most likable guys in real life that you would ever want to meet. He's soft-spoken. He's thoughtful. He's considerate. He cares about his coworkers and friends. Every year, I knew I was going to get a shipment of something to my house for Christmas. Um, he never let me down. He always came through with something. Um, and in general, I think that Skip is well-liked by his coworkers. That was my experience with him. I never uh, had an ill word with Skip during our nine years plus together. And you would think that when you work that closely with someone for that long, at some point. Now, I I was getting a little tired of the Tim Tebow show, and that was you know all a product of Skip, and ultimately that's why I said I had to get out. But like I never resented Skip for that. It never affected our personal relationship. And again, the Skip Bayless you see on TV is completely different from Skip Bayless in real life. Quiet, kind, thoughtful, considerate. A, a good guy, a really good guy. When did you realize your sports centers with Keith Olbermann were, were, were turning into something bigger than just anchoring sports highlights? I think when we met people outside of Connecticut, when we would be at the ESPYs or we'd be in New York or we'd be in Los Angeles and you were meeting people who were reciting things that you said or they recognized you, I remember TV Guide, when TV Guide was still around, and this was probably mid-90s, and they said the 10 shows to watch, 10 new shows to watch, and Keith and I were one of the 10. And things changed that day because it was like there are people out there who are watching, enjoying, following, athletes. When I'd be on the road, if I was covering the NBA Finals or World Series, athletes knew who you were, would come up to you, it so we we learned but we didn't set out for that we never ever discussed strategy we never once said hey if we do this this will happen or why don't we do more of this never never once did it because every time we came in we caught up with each other and then when we did the show we didn't know what the other person wrote we wanted to entertain each other because you're in a sterile environment you're in bristol connecticut in a studio with a floor director and a couple of camera people. We were trying to entertain them. That was it. We had, I was not aware of ratings. We, we just did it. And in thinking back on it, we, ESPN didn't want us to succeed the way we did, which is going to sound strange because nowadays they would kill for that because they're all about entertainment. Back then, they wanted us to sort of all fall in line and SportsCenter was going to be the most important part. You're there to do Sports Center. It's not, you know, Sports Center is lucky to have you two doing Sports Center. And management fought us on that and did. So we did a lot of things surreptitiously, very clandestine uh, things that we said or how we said it. Uh, it was late at night. We didn't know if our bosses were watching, but that was the fun. There was some danger to it. 
And then one time we got called in on the carpet and we, we got read the riot act, but it didn't stop us. It just, I think made us even smarter of trying to get away with things today. They would encourage all of that. And it might go back to the Howard Stern analogy. When you get to do everything, it takes away from a little bit of the mystery. Whereas we had to sneak, be sneaky in doing it. And I thought that that had that danger element and it was smart humor. I, we never wanted to be obvious. We wanted to be snarky, but we also wanted to tap you on the shoulder and say, you know, if you got it, great. If not, it's okay. We'll move on to the next highlight. So if, if with ESPN radio, they kind of similarly didn't want you to necessarily succeed the way you have succeeded now, um, by, by having more of a, a personality and, and freedom with the show. Um, what, when you were at ESPN, gave you the, the confidence or who gave you the confidence to, to be able to push limits and go outside the box with SportsCenter? Uh, probably Keith Oberman did, because I, I think I was so worried about making mistakes. And I would watch a re-air of SportsCenter every night. We'd get done, I'd immediately go in and get the tape, and I'd go upstairs and I'd watch to see what I did wrong. And I remember Keith walked by and he said, what are you doing? You got the bleeping job. And he was right. I, but I was, I was, I was searching for perfection and I, sh I should have been searching for you know, what I was doing right instead of what I was doing wrong. Like, are we having fun? Are we doing it in the way that we want to do this? How's the writing? Uh, Cause we had to write, you know, our entire show. Uh, together. But I, I think then I sort of exhaled a little bit and went, all right. Cause Keith would go, why aren't you the same person on the air that you are off the air? And he was right. But I came from CNN where when I was at CNN, it was the world's most important network. That was, that was their motto. Well, who am I to show my personality on the world's most important network I'm supposed to be beholden to the world's most important network. And as a result, I think I was always pushing the network first and it wasn't about my personality. But when you're doing highlights and it's late at night, you want to keep people up, you want them to have fun, you want to entertain them, then it has to come from your personality. And it, it, that, that really changed my direction of who I was at ESPN. And, and my first show I ever did was with Chris Berman. And you can't be around Chris and sort of not try to have some fun. You're not going to rival him, but you also have to compliment him and, and sort of be in the same space. And you can't help but have fun. Or you, you should always have fun. What was it that uh, happened on SportsCenter that, that prompted management to call you guys in and, and read you the riot act? I think they thought we were getting full of ourselves, that we were getting ahead of those four letters. And, and they were probably right. But I think we, you kind of have to push the boundary to know where the boundary is. And that's what we were trying to find out. What is the boundary? And okay, that's it. Now we can work our way back a little bit. But you know, I'm glad we did it. But I'm glad management said something to us because I didn't I didn't want it to be where we we were overt in what we were trying to do. I just loved where it was a little bit of a surprise, a little bit of a mystery, sneaky, uh, subtle. That's that was always my approach. And, you know, sometimes you play the straight man to Keith and maybe it's vice versa. But we sort of knew what we were doing without ever communicating what we were doing. Interestingly, um, a, another broadcaster who went to law school is Bill Walton. So who do you think would make the, um, the better attorney, you or Bill? <laughs> Can you? That is probably the best question I've ever heard in my life. Uh, can you? I'm just picturing a sitcom where we are <laughs> two attorneys at the same firm. And like, there... <laughs> You know, some clients get filtered to me because they're the straight laced ones. And then other clients get filtered to Bill because they taste colors. And uh, I just like the idea of the odd couple sort of scenario there. I think his mind is like nitroglycerin. Like 
being around him is the most explosive time you can have in your life cerebrally. And so thinking about him as an attorney, I, I don't, I don't know what the jurors would think. Like I'm picturing the jury box. I'm picturing me being the opposition and listening to him and looking and being like, I actually don't know what the hell they think about that. I have no clue. And uh, so I think the answer is him because he's a highly creative person. Uh, but I would love to be in a case against him because he like the sneaky thing about Bill is he's uber competitive. And I would really enjoy the idea of sparring with him, like like a forensics tournament with Bill Walton, the debate tournament with Bill Walton could be amazing television like Bill take this side, right? Like fracking is a good idea. Go. I would love that. How was working with Bill overall? I, I assume that's not something that you had on your uh, your bingo card back when you were in college. Dude, it's the best. I mean, it is it is such an enlivening experience because I have to be ready for literally everything. I've always thought play-by-play -play is a, a test in that moment of everything you know, but yeah, yeah, we're not going to hit the range with anybody else that Bill hits. So I have to be ready for him to ask me, like, have you read Steve Martin's book? What do you think of Myanmar? <laughs> like, that's the range. That's the spectrum. And it, it really is like doing a crossword puzzle, except nobody tells you how many letters are in the word. And frankly, there are no clues. You just have to go and say words and see if you can follow along. Is there is there one thing that that he said to you on a broadcast that uh, either surprised you or or made you laugh, caught you off guard more than the rest that that sticks out? I mean, there are so many. It's it, the time that he asked if my father ever played for Jerry Tarkanian, uh, and I said no. My dad was an air traffic controller. <laughs> And then he was like, but did he play for Jerry Tarkanian? I mean, you just keep going. Uh, when he did the, the White Sox game with me and the first question he asked James McCann in our post-game interview, he had a bunch of eye black on and Bill said, what is that under your eyes? That was the first question. It's like doing a game with the mind of an eight-year-old in the best way. You know how kids will just like say the thing that they see to their discredit sometimes like that's what he does and then he asked halfway through the interview james was about to leave and i said uh i said okay james great job and and he said something like bill do you have any other questions and i said the rest of this is on you okay Be because you had the chance to leave and you didn't and then but james loved it he he really enjoyed the whole experience um and then bill asked him like what do you eat before a game? This is a post-game interview. It's supposed to be like three <laughs> questions. It just kept going and going and going. But I, I think I truly think the most ridiculous thing we have done together actually involves a tiger. Uh, early 2020, before the pandemic hit, Bill and I had an Arizona State basketball game. And his producer for a lot of games, Tim Sullivan, who is just awesome, uh, Sully had the idea that we would go to Arizona State baseball and Spencer Torkelson was playing for the Sun Devils at the time and he was going to be the first overall pick and he had this idea Sully did that Torque would teach Bill Walton how to hit so we did a whole bit where Bill is in catcher's gear and he's like starting to play catcher and then Bill wearing the catcher's gear goes into the batting cage wearing full catcher's gear and Torque is trying to teach him how to hit. And it was an absolute just gushing nightmare geyser of fun. <laughs> and Torque still remembers it. Like I went into the Tigers clubhouse in June this year and Spencer came up to me and was like, how's Bill? I said, you remember that? And he's like, of course I remember that. So, you know, that it's but it is the spectrum that you cover with Bill Walton. If you like creativity, I suggest it. <laughs> Did you have total trust in in Bill's 
filter that whatever he was going to say or wherever he was taking a story, it was going to be fit for a national audience? Who cares is my answer. <laughs> I, that's the fun part. It, you know, fit for a national audience is such a movable standard and fit for fit for his moral compass is what I knew it would be. Yeah. And I also know that, you know, I have my own personal parachute there as well. Like, I don't have to play along per se <laughs> if he says something that I don't agree with. I do want to be a good partner. But like, that's that's the fun of it. The fun of it is you don't know and you're not certain exactly where it's going to end up and you react. I mean, I my body has never let me be a quarterback. But the idea of like, okay, you're going to have three seconds max to throw this pass unless you're really good and evasive. Like you better know your reads real fast and you better you better make that choice. That's fun to watch with like Peyton Manning. It's fun to watch with all these quarterbacks who do it at a high level with Patrick Mahomes. It's fun to do. And that's my only way of doing it in life. Jason, you were awesome. Uh, thank you so much for joining, joining the podcast today. I really appreciate it. I'm glad to. Thank you, Brandon. That is Jason Benetti. I'm Brandon Contis. This is the Awful Announcing Podcast. Please rate and subscribe to this podcast. Please also subscribe to Awful Announcing's YouTube page. But regardless of how you consume Awful Announcing and the Awful Announcing Podcast, thanks for listening and be good. Thanks for listening to the Awful Announcing Podcast. For the latest news spanning the sports media landscape and more, check out awfulannouncing.com and follow us at Awful Announcing.